So we're reading Genesis chapter 29, verses 1 to 30. And this carries straight on from last week. Jacob has left the, his home fleeing the anger of Esau and is now searching for a wife. After having a vision from God, it says, Jacob resumed his journey and went east, went to the eastern country. He looked and saw a well in a field. Three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it because the sheep were watered from this well. But a large stone covered the opening of the well. The shepherds would roll the stone from the opening of the well and water the sheep when all the flocks were gathered there. Then they would return to the stone to its place over the well's opening. Jacob asked the men at the well, My brothers, where are you from? We're from Haran, they answered. Do you know Laban, grandson of Nahor? Jacob asked them. They answered, We know him. Is he well? Jacob asked. Yes, they said, and here is his daughter, Rachel, coming with his sheep. Then Jacob said, Look, it is still broad daylight. It is, not time, is it not time for the animals to be gathered? What are the flocks? Then go out and let them graze. But they replied, We can't until all the flocks have been gathered and the stone is rolled from the well's opening. Then we will water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. As soon as Jacob saw his uncle Laban's daughter, Rachel, with his sheep, he went up, rolled the stone from the opening, and watered his uncle's Laban's sheep. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept loudly. He told Rachel that he was her father's relative, Rebekah's son. She ran and told her father. When Laban heard the news about his sister's son, Jacob, he ran to meet him, hugged him and kissed him, then took him to his house, and Jacob told him all that had happened. Laban said to him, Yes, you are my own flesh and blood. After Jacob had stayed with him a month, Laban said to him, Just because you are my relative, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The older was named Leah. The younger was named Rachel. Leah had tender eyes, but Rachel was shapely and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel. So he answered Laban, I'll work for you for seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban replied, Better that I give her to you than some other man. Stay with me. So Jacob worked for seven years for Rachel, and they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Since my time is complete, give me my wife so I can sleep with her. So Laban invited all the men of the place and sponsored a feast. That evening, Laban took his daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob, and he slept with her. And Laban gave his slave Zilpah to his daughter Leah as her slave. When morning came, there was Leah. So he said to Laban, What is this that you have done to me? Wasn't it for Rachel that I worked for you? Why have you deceived me? Laban answered, It is not the custom of this place to give the younger daughter in marriage before the firstborn. Celebrate this week of wedding celebration, and we will give you this younger one in return for working yet another seven years for me. And Jacob did just that. He finished the week of celebration, and Laban gave his daughter Rachel as his wife. Laban gave his slave Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her slave. Jacob slept with Rachel also, and indeed he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he worked for Laban another seven years. This is the word of the Lord. This is one of the more interesting parts of Jacob's story, so I think it's more than appropriate that we pray as we come to think about what God is teaching us through this strange turn of events. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that you will help us to understand it, enable us to put it into practice, and we ask that we will be changed into the likeness of your Son through the hearing of it. Amen. So have you ever read a book or seen a movie with a twist so shocking that you would never have expected it in the first place. Sometimes the twist in the story is a sudden good ending, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. Sometimes it's a sudden unexpected defeat, snatching failure from the jaws of success. 
And sometimes it's a revelation so mind-bending that it makes you reread the entire story. Well, here in Genesis 29, we see the twist in Jacob's story. And we get front row seats to see it unfold. And it helps us rethink the entire story and forces us to ask the question, where is God when things go wrong? Where is God when times get rough? Well, it certainly doesn't look like a rough or a hard time at the start of the chapter. Jacob is fleeing from his brother's murderous wrath under the guise of looking for a wife. He's just had a great vision from God where God has reiterated the promises that he made to Abraham and Isaac to be with him, to give him a land, to make him a great nation. And as he starts out on this journey since his vision, it certainly looks like God is definitely with him. In his wanderings, he finds a well. As we heard from our first Bible reading, wells are a great place in the first century to find a wife. Not only does he find a well, he finds the right well. And there's a stone covering the well. Then suddenly, a beautiful woman appears. And in a classic boy-meets-girl moment, he gets to show off his strength by moving the stone away from the well and offering water to her sheep. Then he finds out She's Laban's daughter, exactly the right family. This is where he was going. This is exactly what he's looking for. If God is going to make him a great nation, he needs a wife. Here she is. Surely it seems like God is there. But did you notice in the passage, God isn't mentioned at all. How can I say that God is with him and watching over him when God isn't mentioned? Well, because we've just had a vision from God. God has promised to be with Jacob, and this is God fulfilling that promise to him. We know he's there because he said he's going to be there. See, in the Bible, there is no such thing as coincidence. Everything is directed and governed by God. If you think that God can only work in the big and spectacular moments of life, then your God is too small. More often than not, the constant teaching of the Bible is that God works through the small, mundane, and the everyday to bring about his promises. Jesus puts it like this in Matthew chapter 10. Aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent. God is in control of everything. In Jacob's story, it is God who makes sure that Jacob finds the well, and not just any well, the well where Laban's sheep come to get their water. And it's God who makes sure that Rachel is on shepherding duty that day and not some hired hand. It is God that makes sure that Laban is open to Jacob marrying one of his daughters. Throughout all of Jacob's success in the start of this chapter, God is behind it all, making sure his promises to Jacob are fulfilled. And we even get that picture from verse 20 when we see that Jacob worked for seven years and they seemed only like a few days. Surely there can be no doubt that God is with him. Where do you give the credit for all the good things that you have in your life? Do you give credit to coincidence, hard work, your skills, talents, and natural abilities? Or do you give the credit where it is due to the God who gave you those skills, talents, and opportunities that have gotten you where you are today? The only reason you are where you are today is because God has brought you there. Just as God brought Jacob to the right well, God has brought us here and put us in exactly the place he wants us to be so that he can fulfill his promises that he has made to us in his son. And so we need to give credit where it's due. 
and thank God for all the things that he has given us, all the opportunities that he has allowed us to take and all the skills and talents that he has provided us with so that we can be where we are. But then verse 25 happens. Suddenly, in Jacob's story, the twist comes. He's just had his wedding feast. He's going back to his tent to meet his wife. Verse 25 says, When morning came, there was Leah. So he said to Laban, Why have you done this? Wasn't it for Rachel that I worked for you? Why have you deceived me? Suddenly, the deceiver becomes the deceived. What's going on? Has God given up on Jacob? Has God left him? Was the twist in Jacob's story too much for God? He didn't like it. He put down the book and walked away. Well, no, God is with Jacob just as much here as he was at the beginning of the chapter. You see, what's going on here is that God is letting Jacob feel the consequences of his actions. Let him feel the suffering that his sin has caused to get him ready to go back and meet Esau. Jacob deceived Esau. Jacob broke his family in half. And that has forced him to flee to a country where he didn't know that you were supposed to marry the older daughter before you married the younger one. If Jacob had not deceived Esau, he wouldn't be in this situation. And God is letting him feel the consequences of those actions to teach him a lesson, to know what Esau went through so that he is ready to seek forgiveness from his brother when he returns. God is with Jacob in his suffering, shaping him, transforming him into a man that will be ready to become the father of of a great nation, the chosen people of God. And there will be times in our life where God lets us feel the consequences of our sin, the times when God needs to teach us something the hard way. Sometimes when you take dinner out of the oven and give it to your children, you need to remind them, don't eat it, it's hot. More often than not, they don't believe you. The only time they believe you is when they try and grab a piece and start eating it and burn themselves. That's when they start to trust you when you say, don't touch it, it's hot. And we're just the same. We constantly fail to trust that God's way of life is best. And so there are times when God will let us feel the consequences of those actions. Not to punish us, but to teach us so that we learn to trust him and grow in our faith. When we find ourselves slipping in our relationship with God when he feels distant because we've been constantly prioritizing life, sport and work over church and Bible study, well, that's because God is letting us, reminding us that he called us into a people for a reason. He called us to gather together with his people to help us grow when we find ourselves constantly stressed and angry because we feel like we have to work 24-7 in order to earn enough money, that's God reminding us that he tells us to seek first his kingdom, reminding us that money isn't the be-all and end-all in life. Not all suffering is a result of our sin, but some of it is, and God is still there, shaping us, transforming us and getting us ready to live life forever with him as his chosen people. God is not limited by our circumstances. He is not bound by our weaknesses. We will have to face the consequences of our sin every so often, but that is so we will be made fit and ready for life with him. But what about the suffering that isn't discipline, the suffering that isn't a result of our sin? Is God still there? Well, here we find Leah. Leah forced into a marriage with a man who doesn't love her, didn't even want to marry her in the first place. 
can't imagine the suffering that she goes through. But God sees that suffering and blesses her despite it. You see, it is through Leah, not Rachel, that God will co- that will come most of the 12 tribes of Israel. We saw the 12 names up here with Mary. Only two of those children came from Rachel. The rest were Leah's children. It is from Leah who will come Judah, who will be the royal line of kings in Israel. It is from Leah who comes Levi, from which we get the line of high priests, the servants of God. It is through Leah that we get David and ultimately Jesus. It is through Leah who God fulfills his promise to Abraham that the whole world will be blessed by his offspring. Even in Leah's suffering, God is working not just for her good, but for the good of the whole world. God can take our suffering and use it for our good, for his glory. Where is God when times are tough? He is right there with us, walking next to us, shaping us, guiding us, and saying, I am with you. I will bring you out. And even though it doesn't feel like it at the time, when we suffer, it never feels like anything good can come of it. But God, in his infinite grace and mercy, will make sure that something good does come something good for us, something good that we can use to bless the people of God around us. Because for God, your suffering is never wasted. The hard times are not evidence of God abandoning you, but evidence that he is still there, walking with you every step of the way. And we even have one more advantage than Jacob had because we know that the ultimate consequence for our sin will not have to be paid by us. The sufferings of Jesus has taken that for us. Jesus took the suffering and horrific death of his son and used that to pay the price that we all needed to pay, the debt that we were under, and set us free called us to be one of his people. And so we know the ultimate consequences of our sin will not have to be borne by us, but will have already been taken by Christ on the cross. God is with us in our hard times. And when Paul reflects on the grace that has been showed to him in his times of suffering, It leads him to say this from our reading in 2 Corinthians. God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I'll most gladly boast all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power may reside in me. When we are weak, when we are facing times of stress and trouble and hardship, With Paul, Jacob, we can turn around and say, look what God has done for me. Even though I was weak, he was strong. Even though I didn't know what was going on, he did. And he used that time for my good and for his glory. It's always hard to see at the time, but God promises to be with us. And he doesn't just mean the good times. Jacob, he was too poor to afford the bride price to marry Rachel. So he ends up working for seven years for Laban. Jesus suffered the most horrific death humanity has ever come up with. Paul suffered with a thorn in his flesh that God would not take away. But God used him to bring the gospel 
to thousands upon thousands of people. He used the sufferings of Christ to bring salvation to the world and he used Jacob to bring about his chosen people. And if God can work like that through these poor, weak and suffering people, imagine what he can do with you if you're willing to let him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are with us in our times of suffering. We thank you that you have not left us. And we pray that you will help us to see the good that you are working in us and to help us to see that you are preparing us for life with you. Amen. (laughs)